On this edition of Native Report, we attend a rededication ceremony for the Spokane Tribal Fish Hatchery. We learn about the protection of sacred sites and cultural resources at the National Congress of American Indians Mid-Year Conference. And we meet longtime advocate for Native American interests, Frank Ducheneau. We also learn what we can do to lead healthier lives and hear from our elders on this edition of Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Rita Aspinwall. And I'm Ernie Stevens. It was in 1991 when the Spokane Tribal Hatchery was developed to help mitigate the loss of salmon to the Upper Columbia River. The primary objective is to produce Kokanee salmon and rainbow trout to create and sustain a harvestable fishery. Join us now as we attend the rededication ceremony of the hatchery. As an eagle flew overhead, the mood at the Spokane Tribal Fish Hatchery was celebratory as the Spokane Nation celebrated 25 years of operation of the hatchery. A new agreement was also signed with the Bonneville Power Administration to support the hatchery for another 20 years. We just recently uh, renegotiated, successfully renegotiated a long-term O&M agreement with Bonneville Power Administration. Uh, so today was a day to kind of commemorate that commitment to show that we're serious about this program and committing to uh, can, making sure that it has some longevity to it and that it continues to be a pathway to reconnect our people to the river and the resources that it has. I have seven full-time uh, Spokane tribal members, all, we're all tribal member staff that works here. It's been all tribal members from day one. We were raising fish in this creek before we even had a hatchery to prove that we could do it. It was contentious when the tribe was first negotiating with Bonneville over who would manage the hatchery. We wanted this hatchery built on the reservation and we wanted it ran by tribal members. The hatchery serves a lot of different functions and, uh, and I'm just, this one person, there's a lot of people who put their heart and soul in this place. They're all tribal members. And so they have a, they have a, they have a, a vested interest and a stronger connection today than they did 25 years ago as I have. The ancestral homelands of the Spokane Nation once included the area around the city of Spokane. For generations, the people harvested kokanee salmon and trout that were at one time plentiful in the rivers and lakes that surround the present day reservation. But that all ended with the construction of dams. Spokane, uh, Spokane people were a river people and a salmon people. We sustained off of the salmon. So the salmon came all the way up to our rivers, our creeks, and our falls, and our salmon chiefs would regulate the commerce on the, on the river of the salmon harvest. And so um, I may be a little bit low on this figure, but about 80% of our sustenance was on the salmon. Our current day reservation is surrounded by three bodies of water, the Shimmikin Creek to the east, the Spokane River to the south and the Columbia River to the west. And so when Cooley Dam was built, it flooded our lands. And some of the elders you've seen today actually had homes along the river and they had to move from those lands because the dam, the water um, flooded their lands. And we lost the salmon, we lost the eel. They, they no longer could make it up over that huge dam. And so because we, we sustained off of the salmon, that was our life. A lot of our culture and traditions and practices revolved around the salmon. So when you lose something that drastic, you lose your land, um, people are put in boarding school, your grandparents, their parents were pulled from the home, and you, you lose your traditional foods, you, you kind of go through what we call historical trauma. 
and your people lose what they were. The hatchery was developed to help mitigate the loss of the resource, and the signing of the renegotiated agreement will ensure there is a fishery for future generations. Today was a really special event. It was an opportunity for us to come together with the Spokane tribe and, and celebrate a 25-year partnership around this tribal hatchery. Uh, back in the early 1990s, we worked with the tribe to help actually design and then build and fund this facility. And we've been working with them for years and years to make sure it was well-resourced and operating effectively. And most recently, we renewed our agreement uh, for another 20 years to try to continue that partnership going forward. A big part of what we do, uh, both statutorily and because I think we really believe it's the right thing to do, is to work with the tribes and others in the basin to mitigate the impacts that the dams had on salmon throughout the Columbia River and other species of fish and wildlife, quite frankly. So this partnership with the Spokane tribe is, is a, just a perfect example of the kind of work that we do jointly with the tribes to try to restore fish populations, which is of such em enormous cultural uh, significance to the tribes, um, back to the basin. And it's worked quite well here, and uh, we're proud to be part of it. We need to um, protect and uh, express our cultural traditions and values behind this place. Uh, we, can't we can't lose track of that, because all that is a part of the whole big picture when it comes back to reconnecting your identity as a river fishing people. Before Grand Coulee Dam, we wanted for nothing. But after Grand Coulee Dam, we had nothing. Having something like a fish hatchery come back where we can start to bring the salmon back or bring whatever this fish hatchery back to our people, some of our elders will tell you, just bring the salmon back and we will heal. So that's why it is so important because our people we are part of the land we came from. So our connection to the land, our connection to the water, to the air, to the salmon, and people, and respecting all of that is so important. And as long as um, we remember that is the way of our ancestors, we accept that, we teach our children, we will continue as a people. I think a long time ago, they thought the solution was to just get rid of us, and by doing that, they put us on reservations and we'd eventually assimilate. Well, we're here, we're strong, and we will continue to be here forever. Chantel from St. Andrew Parish in Jamaica is a college student and she's working to go to medical school. She asks, Dr. Vinio, what causes gallstones? Well, Chantel, gallstones form in the gallbladder. The gallbladder is a sac that stores bile and is in the right upper quadrant of the abdomen, just under the liver. There are two main ducts that drain from the liver to form the common bile duct, and that duct goes to the first part of the small intestine. Bile is a bitter liquid that the body uses to emulsify fats, which means to keep them in suspension so we can digest them. When we eat something fatty, the gallbladder squeezes and pushes bile into the intestine to mix with the fatty food. One of the old definitions of the word gall means bitterness of spirit. Gallstones are very common. About 80% of gallstones never cause any problems at all and just stay in the gallbladder. Gallstones typically cause problems when they get pushed into the neck of the gallbladder or into the common bile duct itself. A tube that's meant to only move liquid causes lots of pain when it tries to move something solid, and this pain is called colic biliary colic in the case of gallstones. The medical term for gallstones is cholelithiasis. Most gallstones are cholesterol stones. They form when the liver secretes bile supersaturated with cholesterol and that supersaturated bile forms microcrystals that grow over time to become gallstones. Some people have gallbladders that don't contract very well so the bile has a longer time to sit and form stones. About 85 to 90 percent of gallstones are cholesterol stones but there are a couple of other kinds of stones that are less common. Risk factors for gallstones include older age, female gender, pregnancy, obesity, a family history of gallstones, and rapid weight loss. Gallstones are the most common gastrointestinal disease needing hospitalization in the United States. The highest prevalence of gallstones in the United States is in the Native American population. The prevalence rates are relatively low in Asia and Africa. The growing obesity epidemic in the United States 
means gallstones will undoubtedly become even more common. Currently, there are about 700,000 cholecystectomies in the United States every year. Many of these can be done laparoscopically. This means the surgery is done through several very small holes. These surgeries have a relatively shorter recovery time than an open surgery with a larger incision. Sometimes complications like infections or scarring and narrowing of the ducts can happen. These narrow areas are called strictures and can lead to further problems. Having a gallstone obstruct the gallbladder neck or the bile duct is very painful and usually follows a fatty meal. There's a lesson in there somewhere. Remember to call an elder. They've been waiting for your call. I'm Dr. Arnie Vinio, and this is Health Matters. There have been numerous recent efforts by Native nations to protect their sacred places and cultural resources. A breakout session at the National Congress of American Indians Mid-Year Conference addressed how these efforts can be preserved through the transition of a new administration. It is a packed meeting room at the 2016 National Congress of American Indians Mid-Year Conference. Attendees are on hand to hear personal testimony about the need to protect sacred sites across Indian country and what must be done to repatriate cultural items. One topic of discussion is the Akama Shield. Well, the Akama Shield is a ceremonial piece of cultural patrimony belonging to the Pueblo of Akama. We became aware of it in 2015, and we are continuing to try to repatriate that from uh, the Eve Auction House in France. Cultural patrimony is defined in, in federal documents as an item unique to a, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but unique to a tribal group. And uh, so it cannot leave the uh, tribe. It has a purpose, a continued purpose. Uh, in the ceremonial uh, life of uh, that tribal group. And so the Akama Shield is an item of cultural patrimony. It's still used yeah, periodically in our tribe. It has a purpose and it's still recognized as being an item that is ours. And we, around May 30th of this year, uh, the Akama Shield was removed from the auction block and we've been working with federal authorities to bring it home. And so as the current events uh, unfold, we're still awaiting word, final word as to its disposition. So we have not gotten it back, but we're hopeful that uh, things will work out in our favor. Another item of discussion was Bears Ears Butte in Utah, recently named as a national monument by President Obama. The reason for the designation? Native artifacts from the site were being looted and sold on the private market. For some in attendance, this brought to mind a recent situation in Oregon. In the session today, I really appreciated the, uh, the people talking about the Bear Ears sacred site. Um, sacred sites, uh, Many of the tribes don't like to identify them because then they become tourist attractions. However, uh, decisions need to be made on how to protect them and a lot of times we have to strategize and uh, work with partners to do that. And for the Malheur uh, Wildlife Refuge, it was managed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, it was public, open to the public, and in our case we had a lot of public support. Um, but uh, on the other hand, uh, I know that uh, the tribe uh, quietly worked with the feder their federal partner to keep quiet the locations of the burial sites and the artifacts. But those were exposed when that militant group came in and took over the federal government facility there. The effects of that, I mean, the bare ears, the, this could happen to that sacred site. Somebody, a group could go in and take it over and do the same thing and de de desecrate it and, and, and it's really sad that that can happen. One federal agency representative provided an update on the necessity for protecting sacred sites and repatriating items of cultural patrimony. 
One of the roles in my job is I am currently serving as the chairman to the Sacred Sites MOU. And the Sacred Sites MOU was signed in 2012, and it's an interagency agreement between the uh, Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, the Department of the Interior, um, the Department of Agriculture, and the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation. And it is uh, an MOU amongst all of us to have a sounding board to work on issues to make certain that sacred sites that are on federally managed property are protected, but that also tribal access is guaranteed as much as humanly possible, and also to uh, promote interagency coordination collaboration uh, regarding sacred sites. We all have been able to make recommendations to senior executive leadership and to the White House Council on Native American Affairs about issues that are coming up in Indian country. So one of the things that we were able to do is, is talk amongst each other as, as a federal family and come up with different ways that we can protect tribal information regarding where sacred sites are and how to make certain that that information is not necessarily put out for public information. In our particular case, it's France, the Eve Auction House, uh, not recognizing our uh, claim to an item and not recognizing us as being sovereigns. And so we're working with the State Department, Department of Justice, Department of Interior to communicate uh, what we uh, would like for France to recognize. We don't want everything in their position. We just want the items that are, are items of cultural patrimony to us and to us in particular, the Pueblo of Africa. We all need to work together. And uh, organizations like NCAI is uh, critical. You know, if we stand together, we can do mighty things. One of the first things you notice in a lot of Indian communities is they walk with a little more spring in their step and a sparkle in their eye uh, because now in their communities the tribes are somebody. They're important economic players. Uh, and uh, you look around the neighborhoods and you see clinics, you see schools, uh, you see economic opportunity that didn't exist before those gaming revenues came along. In many places, like Pine Ridge, the main thing it does, it doesn't make millions of dollars to be distributed, it gives jobs to people that didn't have jobs before. And uh, that's so, so important. And of course, there are places where they're located next to a great market, and they make tons of money. And they're generous with their dollars. They support the, the uh, you know, the less fortunate. And uh, so it, uh, it's, it's really changed the face of Indian uh, country in that respect. Now, it's not divided upright, so to speak. That is, there are a lot of tribes that don't have those opportunities because of their uh, rural uh, locations and so forth. But that's just the way the entrepreneurship system works. Uh, uh, you know, Bill Gates doesn't give me any of his money, uh, and I don't ask for it, and uh, I'm not going to get it. Uh, so the, you know, there's no obligation on the fact on the to, of a tribe that's making a lot of money to give it to anybody in particular. But as I say, they've been good stewards, and uh, uh, overall, it, it's been a, a grand success. Frank Ducheneau has had a long and distinguished role as a key legislative advocate for Indian interests. He blended a tireless support for the rights of Indians with an understanding of the legislative process. Tad Johnson finds out more from one of the framers of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Frank Ducheneau may not be a household name, but he should be. He worked on Capitol Hill during a time of great change across Indian country. He started out rather humbly. Out of law school, I was, I had a lot of debts and a wife and a kid, and I needed uh, money. So I went to work for the old OEO program, the Johnson War in Poverty in Kansas City, and I worked there almost two years. And then uh, Bob Bennett, who was Commissioner of Indian Affairs at the time, that's when they had a commissioner. Um, was looking for an Indian lawyer to work in the Congressional Relations Office. And I was tired of Kansas City and OEO and 
uh, put in for it. I think my dad, who was chairman and knew Bennett, probably pushed it a little bit, but I got a job there with uh, the Congressional Relations Office in BIA in D.C. He then worked for the BIA for almost five years, and then with the National Congress of American Indians. But it was when Frank went to work for Congressman Mo Udall that several key pieces of legislation were passed. Other players included Forrest Girard and Senator Scoop Jackson. Forrest and I were House Senate counterparts for about uh, four years. I think uh, I came up in 73 and Forrest was already there. And then uh, I was in the 93rd and 94th Congress with Forrest. And then he went down uh, under uh, Carter. He became the first assistant tech secretary. So, but I think for those four years, those two Congresses, Forrest and I were counterparts, House and Senate. And we got a, we got a lot done in those four years. Termination was really the policy issue that was preventing good legislation from being considered because uh, tribes would, uh, when, when they first floated the, the Nixon administration first floated the self-determination legislation, the Indians were fearful of it. Even though it proposed to transfer these programs to tribal control, they were fearful because they saw termination. We needed to do something on uh, putting a, a nail in the coffin of termination, and that would best be done by uh, restoring the Menominee tribe to federal recognition. So one of our uh, major bills in that first Congress was a bill restoring the Menominee to federal recognition. And we, in the House at least, took the position that that was the end of termination. Other major pieces of legislation included the Indian Self-Determination Act, the Indian Finance Act, the Indian Health Care Improvement Act, among several others. Toward the end of his career on the Hill, Frank helped write the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. Two lawsuits caught his eye. The Brona Ranch case came out of California, and, and it, uh, it, the sheriff of the county there, Brona Ranch was trying to run a bingo uh, operation not in accordance with state law. And the sheriff came in and shut him down. Brona Ranch sued in the district court uh, at Juan. Uh, and then they went up, uh, appealed up to the circuit court. Similarly, in, in Florida, the Seminoles were running a, trying to run a bingo operation. The sheriff came in, shut him down, another lawsuit. Both the circuit court uh, in Barona Ranch and Seminole held that where state law, gaming laws, were not criminal in nature, but civil in nature, then they did not apply on Indian reservations. Even though California and Florida both appealed the Barona Ranch and the Seminole rulings, the Supreme Court did not take those cases. That is, until a Cabazon case had the same issues. And this scared the hell out of us, out of me. So I drafted a, what I now call a sellout bill for Mo. It was a very bad bill, but it was an attempt to try to salvage something before the Supreme Court came and took it all away. We were all very surprised when the Supreme Court came down almost a slam dunk for the Indians. We jerked our sell-off bill off the table and we slammed that other bill down and, and uh, eventually that bill became law. That bill became the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. We made some compromises and that, that was not good for Indians. But the one thing we did do in, in IGRA, as we negotiated it, was where there was a tribal state compact for class three gaming. We'll just shorten it to casino gaming. Where there was a, where the state and the tribe involved had negotiated a compact for class three gaming that was approved by the secretary. Then a federal law on the books for years I can't remember when it was first adopted in the 30s or 40s, which made it a crime to gamble on, to have gambling machines on Indian reservations, 
we said that law will be waived. And that's the only, th that's the reason there are Indian casinos all over the country is because we provided for the waiver of that law. I, I thought there were going to be casinos, but I didn't think they would be the things they are today. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. We'll see you next time on Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and is an ICWA social worker with Fond du Lac Social Services. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and is a film and television producer. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. <laughs>